If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 3. Uh, we're going to start right at verse 1. I think the Apostle Paul is sometimes hard to follow. And the passages I'm going to preach through this evening are really kind of difficult. They, they seem to cover several things. They, they jump from one thought to another and almost seem a little bit disconnected. The famous preacher D. Martin Lloyd-Jones considered the verses that we're looking at today uh, some of the most difficult scripture verses he ever preached. So when D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that, then I know it's, it's true. Paul's train of thought is just kind of difficult to follow in these passages, so I'm just going to do the best I can. And by God's grace, I, I hope you get something out of this message tonight and somewhat understand it. Uh, last Sunday, we looked at Romans 2, 17 through 29, and we saw in those passages uh, the Jews believed they were right in God's eyes, but, but they weren't. And this background sets the stage for the passages that we'll cover today. The Jews thought all was well between them and God, and they believed that based on three reasons. They believed they were right with God because they had been given the law and they knew the law. They believed they were right with God because they had the ceremony of circumcision. They believed they were right with God because of their lineage. They were descendants of Abraham. But the Apostle Paul showed them how none of those things actually made them right with God. They had the law, but they didn't obey it. They had circumcision, which was a sign that they were God's people, but they often didn't follow the Lord. They had the Jewish lineage. Abraham was their forefather, but John the Baptist said, God's able to raise up children uh, from these stones. God is able to raise up children to Abraham. So the law couldn't save them. The, the ceremony of circumcision couldn't save them. Their lineage couldn't save them. And so Paul went on to say they weren't even, he, they, he went on to go so far as to say they weren't even true Jews. Uh, in Romans 2.28, he said, for you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you've gone through the Jewish ceremony of circumcision. <clears throat> but then Paul goes on to say who the true Jew really is. Romans 2.29, no, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God, and true circumcision is not a cutting of the body, but a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. Whoever has that kind of change seeks praise from God, not from people. So Paul said the true Jew is one who has his heart right with God. Paul said to these Jews, in order to be a true Jew, in order to be saved, you must have your, right, your heart right with God. Your heart must be changed by the Spirit of God. And that's what we talked about last week, and that's where we left off. So this week we're going to continue a look at Romans chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. In these verses, Paul anticipates that the Jews who read this letter aren't going to like the things he had just said. That They're not going to like someone telling them they aren't true Jews. They're not going to like someone telling them they aren't right with God. <clears throat> they're not going to like someone telling them the way they think and the way they believe is not going to save them. They're going to be offended. They're going to protest. And so Paul anticipates this. So in the next few verses, Paul anticipates three different responses that he expects from these Jews. He expects that when they read this letter and see that they're not saved because of the law or circumcision or lineage, they're going to say, one, what then is the advantage of being a Jew? And number two, God is unfaithful. And number three, God is unfair. That's how Paul expects the Jews to respond to what he has just told them. And so Paul addresses each of these expected responses in the next few verses. Now, even though this part of Romans is aimed at the Jews, there is application for Christians as well. And we'll look at that. But let's look at each of these expected responses. The first one is this. Number one. What's the advantage then of being a Jew? Romans 3, 1 says, then what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the Jewish ceremony of circumcision? The Jews reading this letter are going to be thinking, I guess I'm not saved by having the law. I guess I'm not saved by circumcision. I guess I'm not saved by being a descendant of Abraham. What's the point then? What's the advantage of being a Jew? Well, the Apostle Paul has a quick reply to that question. Romans 3, 2 it says being a Jew has many advantages. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. It's significant. 
It's significant that the Bible says the first and chief advantage of being a Jew is that they have been given the whole revelation of God. It doesn't say the first advantage is that they were God's chosen people, though they were. It doesn't say the first advantage is that they have been given the promises and covenants, though they had. The Bible says the Jews have many advantages, but the first one, the chief one listed, is that they have God's revelation, the scriptures. They were entrusted with the whole Old Testament, and that was a tremendous advantage and a blessing. The Old Testament contained within it all that was needed to make a person wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. And so Paul said, having the revelation of God is the first or the chief advantage of being a Jew. Consider this, the Gentiles didn't have God's word. And as a result, they were living in darkness. They didn't have hope. Ephesians 2.12 says, uh, speaks of the Gentiles. It says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from God's people, Israel, and you did not know the promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. And so the Gentiles were without hope, but the Jews had the word of God. They had hope, how privileged they were. So when the Jews asked, what advantage is it to be a Jew if the law can't save me, and circumcision can't save me, and being related to Abraham can't save me, what advantage is it to be a Jew? Paul would say to them, you were entrusted with the word of God. The word of God has in it exactly what you need to know in order to be saved. Being a Jew is an advantage. Now, obviously, as we have seen, many of the Jews were not followers of the Lord, even though they had God's word. Many of them didn't get it. They did the outward signs and the ceremonies, but but their heart wasn't with the Lord. In Isaiah 29, 13, it says, And so the Lord says, These people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away. And their worship of me amounts to nothing more than human laws learned by rote. But if they would have studied the word that was entrusted to them, if they would have looked at the scriptures they were given, they would have seen how they could have gotten right with God. Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And Isaiah 45, 22 says, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And so the Jews had the scriptures, and in the scriptures they could see how they could turn to God and be made right with God. So when the Jews said, If I'm not saved by having the law, or being circumcised, or being a descendant of Abraham, what advantages is it? To, what advantage is it to be a Jew? Paul would say, "You have a great advantage. You have the Word of God." So let me let me give you an application, Christian. Just think of the blessing and the, and the advantages that we have been given, because we have the very Word of God. We have even more than the Jew had. They had the Old Testament, which was able to make them wise unto salvation. But we have both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this is a privilege that it's amazing. We must not take it for granted. I, w I want to encourage you to read your Bible every day because it's such a privilege. Don't, don't take it for granted. Now, there is a, another response that Paul anticipated from these Jews. Again, he had told them they weren't saved by the law or by circumcision or by lineage. The second response he figured he would hear is this. God is unfaithful. They might say something like, I'm a Jew. And if I'm not saved, God must be unfaithful. That's what Paul anticipated he would hear. After getting this letter, it's very likely that there would be Jews who would say, if I'm not saved. Well, let me back it up. Paul anticipated that these, these, these Jews, they, they would say, God's unfaithful. If I'm, if I'm a Jew and I'm not saved, God must be unfaithful. Now, after getting this letter from Paul, it's very likely that there would be Jews who would say, if I'm not saved, what must I do to be saved? Some would say that. If having the law won't save me and circumcision won't save me and being related to Abraham won't save me, what must I do to be saved? Probably some of the Jews turned to Christ and got saved after reading Paul's letter. But after getting this letter, Paul anticipates that there will be Jews who are offended 
And they'll protest at Paul, what Paul said. And instead of saying, what must I do to be saved then? Instead of repenting and getting right with God, they'll get proud and they'll accuse God. And they'll say, if I'm not saved, it means God's unfaithful. If I'm not saved, then God doesn't keep his promises. They, they might say, maybe my heart hasn't been right with God. But still, God promised that the Jews were his people. And I'm a Jew. Obviously, he didn't come through because you say, I'm not saved. Paul anticipates that. They might say, maybe I haven't been faithful to God in my heart, but God isn't faithful either. He didn't keep his promises if I'm not saved because he said he would save the Jews. This is what Paul anticipated some of these Jews would be saying. And so he has a ready response. Look at Romans 3.3. 3. True, some of them, the Jews, were unfaithful, but just because they broke their promises, does, does that mean God will break his promises? Of course not. Though everyone else in the world is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say, he will be proved right in what he says, and he will win his case in court. Paul is saying to these Jews, yes, you were unfaithful, but don't accuse God of being unfaithful. Though everyone in the whole world is a liar, God will keep his promises. The Jews are his chosen people, and he hasn't abandoned them. He will save them. In fact, as backslidden and turned away and apostate as the Jews have been, God will keep his promises. Don't accuse him of being unfaithful. He will still make the Jews his people. He will save them in spite of how wicked they've been, but not all of them. The Bible says he would save a remnant. In Romans 9, 27, it says, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Paul lets these Jews know God will not break his promises ever. He did promise the Jews that they would be his people. He made many, many promises to them in the Old Testament, and he will keep them. They must never call God unfaithful. Romans 3, 3 again says, True, some of them, the Jews, were unfaithful. But just because they broke their promises, does that mean God will break his promises? Of course not. Though everyone else in the world is a liar, God is true. God will never break his promises. God is saving Israel, but not all of Israel. He's saving a remnant. He's saving the true Jew whose heart is right with God. And in saving that remnant, God remains faithful. Some of the Jews who would read this letter would surely be offended, but they need to know... God never promised to save anyone in their wickedness. Isn't that true? God never promised to save anyone in their wickedness. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man uh, soweth, that shall he also reap. God is true to his promises. He'll save a remnant from the Jews. But to those who think they'll be saved in their wickedness because they are a Jew, they need to think again. The Jew who would accuse God of being unfaithful, he should have accused himself for being unfaithful. Why would he think God had any obligation to save him when his heart was far from God? So God is faithful. Well, let me make an application. How can we apply this text to us today as Christians? If anyone thinks God is obligated to save them because of their baptism, because they have been confirmed, because they have been catechized, because they've said a prayer, yet their heart is far from God, they need to be warned. Don't accuse God of being unfaithful to you. God is always faithful. You are the one who is being unfaithful to him if you aren't right with him in your heart. That's one application. Let me give you a second application. Another application is this. Just like Paul anticipated that the Jews would accuse God of being unfaithful, there are people today who accuse God it may be in other things, but nevertheless, there are people who accuse God. For instance, there are people who accuse God of not being righteous because evil happens in the world. There are people who accuse God of not being good because he sends wicked people to hell or he allows bad things to happen to good people. There are people who accuse God of being unjust because some people are chosen for salvation and some are left in their sins. If you ever find yourself accusing God of anything, if you ever find yourself accusing God that he might not be good, that he might not be just, whatever it is, know this, you are the one who is thinking wrong, and you are the one who will be proven wrong. In Romans 3, 4, it says, though everyone else in the world is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say, he will be proved right in what he says, and he will win his day, his case in court. And so Christian 
Do you ever accuse God? If you do, if you think he is in any way unjust or unrighteous, know this. You're most certainly wrong in your thinking. If anyone ever had a reason to accuse God, though no one does, but if anyone ever thought they had a reason to accuse God, it would have been Job. For what God allowed him to go through. Job's children were killed. He lost all his wealth. Finally, he was stricken with boils from the bottom of his feet to the crown of his head. Job came close to accusing God. He said in Job 10:2, I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. He came close. He was almost saying, God, why are you doing this to me? What have I done to you? He was almost accusing God but of being unjust, but not quite. Do, do you remember what God what Job actually said when he was confronted by God. When Job talked to God, he didn't say, God, what were you thinking? Why did you let me go through this? He didn't say that. God first spoke to Job. He said in Job 38, 2, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? That's what God said to Job. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? And then he asked Job, Amazing, amazing questions for four chapters straight. And then Job spoke to God. Job 42.1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not under understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Whatever Job had thought, whatever he said, that in any way could have been taken as accusing God of not being just to him, he retracted his words. He, repent, he repented in dust and ashes. God is just. God is righteous. God is good. God is love. And God's ways are right always, even if we don't always understand them. And so let's be careful to not be like these Jews who would say God is unfaithful if he doesn't save me. Let's be careful not to accuse God of anything. God's ways are always right. And if there is something about God that we think is unfair or not right, it simply means that somehow we're not seeing something right. Our thinking is somehow wrong. Now there's a third response that Paul expected from these Jews whom he said weren't saved by the law or circumcision or lineage. Paul anticipated that they would say, God is unfair. It's a little bit different than God is unfaithful. He anticipated that they would say, God is unfair. They might say, if I'm not saved, God is unfair. Look at Romans 3, 5. Listen closely. It says, but some say our sins serve a good purpose. For people will see God's goodness when he declares us sinners to be innocent. Isn't it unfair then for God to punish us? That's actually the way some people talk. This last point is a little difficult to follow. Again, the setting. Paul said these Jews would not be saved because they knew the law or by their circumcision or by their lineage. He, they wouldn't be saved by any of those things. And he knew they would be offended. He knew some would say, then, then what's the advantage of being a Jew? So he told them they were entrusted with God's word. He knew some would say, well, if I'm not saved, God is unfaithful. He showed them how God is faithful and how God will save a remnant of Israel in spite of their wickedness. God will preserve a people, a remnant for himself. Now Paul anticipates that some of these Jews will say, if I'm not saved, God's just not being fair. And the reasoning went something like this. All right, we are sinners. Our hearts have been far from God, but God has saved a remnant anyway. God has kept his promises to Israel. He did have mercy and he did save a small remnant. And in saving this remnant, God's mercy was magnified. His grace was magnified. His goodness was magnified and exemplified. Because in order to save Israel at all, he had to declare sinners to be righteous. He had to take wicked people and wash their sins away. He had to give grace to people who didn't deserve it. By saving these sinners, God's grace was shown to be real grace. His mercy was shown to be real mercy. His goodness was shown to be real goodness. This Jew then reasons, my sinfulness actually magnifies God's goodness. 
My sinfulness really shows everyone how gracious and merciful and good God must really be in saving me. My sin serves a good purpose. It actually glorifies God. Why then should I be condemned for something that makes God look good? It's not fair. It's not fair for God to punish us for doing something that makes him look better. That would be their reasoning. Romans 3, 5 says, But some say our sins serve a good purpose, for people will see God's goodness when he declares us sinners to be innocent. Isn't it unfair then for God to punish us? This is actually the way some people talk. And so some Jews actually believe their sins served a good purpose. They magnified how good God must really be. That would magnify God if he would save such sinners. And so they believe that God, that for God to punish them just wasn't fair. They said, isn't it unfair then for God to punish us? Verse 6 continues, of course not. If God is not just, how is he qualified to judge the world? But some might still argue, but how can God judge and condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty, if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? If you follow that kind of thinking, however, you might as well say that the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned, yet some slander me by saying this is what I preach. That's what Paul said. If a person really believed this kind of thinking, if they really thought my sin magnifies God's goodness, they might as well say the more we sin, the better. The more we sin, the more we glorify God. There was actually a preacher, I believe it was in, I believe it was in Russia, and I don't remember what century it was, it was a few hundred years ago, and his name was Rasputin, and he actually preached this way. He said, God is glorified by forgiving our sins and showing us mercy. The more you sin, the more he's glorified. So sin big and sin good, because it will glorify God. This was a preacher in, uh, he got kind of famous, probably because of the way he was preaching, because it was so weird. It was so off the wall. He was a Russian preacher. But Paul said, those who say such things deserve to be condemned. So let me make an application. I can think of actually a, a, a couple of things, a couple applications. One, these Jews accused God of being unfair for punishing them for their sins. They said, my sins magnify God's goodness. It's almost like they were saying I should be rewarded for my sins since they magnify God's goodness. They serve a purpose. And so one application of this point is that we can rationalize anything, can't we? I mean, isn't that true? We can rationalize anything. I mean, the whole human race was thrown into chaos. It was cursed with death. It was separated from God because of sin. Jesus had to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. The wages of sin is death. Hell exists to punish the devil and his demons and unrepentant sinners. Sin is the worst thing in this universe. And yet a person can get so twisted up in their thinking, they can say, my sin glorifies God. It magnifies his goodness. I shouldn't be punished for it. I should be rewarded for it. So the application is be careful of what you rationalize. Be careful of what you try to justify. The simple human mind can rationalize anything. Isn't that true? If a person can think they serve God by sinning, just think of what else they can rationalize. Second application, another application. These Jews were accusing God of being unfair for punishing them for their sins. They thought, why should I be punished if my sin makes God look good? This is the tendency of the human mind, to think God is unfair for punishing people for their sins. Today, many, many evangelicals, many churches that are evangelical, supposedly, no longer believe there is a hell. They believe everyone will be saved. They believe God wouldn't be fair or good if he condemned somebody. And so they say hell is a mythological idea. It's a misunderstanding. For God to send a person to hell would make God a most unfair God. That is their thinking. Christian, don't accuse God of being unfair. Genesis 18.25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Of course he will. God is just and he is fair. And he will punish unrepentant sinners for their sin. And he will be just in doing it. And so let me... Let me come to a conclusion. There were several different points in these few verses. Some of them almost didn't seem to relate to each other. But Paul was addressing Jews who thought they were saved because they knew the law or because of their circumcision 
or because they were related to Abraham. That's the basis on which they, the foundation on which they believed that they were saved. He had to tell them they were wrong. And in the next few chapters, he's going to address how people are saved. But Paul knew these people would be offended and that they would object to what he, what he said. He knew that they would say such things as, what's then the advantage of being a Jew? Or, or, or God isn't faithful or God isn't fair. All these protests show a spirit of pride. And so Christian, we should be humble. And we should not accuse God of anything that would impugn him in any way. We should always know that he is faithful, that he is fair. And if we ever think of God in a way that casts doubt on his goodness, we need to understand that it is our thinking that is wrong, not God's character. We need to understand there's just certain things we just may not know. We may not understand. But we must trust the word of God, that God is faithful, that God is merciful, that God is love, and that God is good. And so with that, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we could look into your word. And Lord, thank you that we can see that we are not saved by these external things, but only by the mercy and the grace and the love of you, dear, dear Father, and, and through what your Son has done. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.